sorry, our script seems to be having, we've an issue with our script today. Anyway, I will just go with what I know. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Saturday Scottsdale Big Book Study, where we will study the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Maria F and I'm a recovered compulsive overeater. I'm from County Dublin in Ireland, and I will be your host for today's study. Our co-hosts today are Mary S and Johan N. And question and answers will be led by Nancy J in Geneva. Please note that the meeting today will be recorded. However, the question and answer session which follows, that will not be recorded. And we'll also post um, details in the chat of the previous week's recordings and also details of how you can make a seventh tradition payment. We ask that if you can please keep your microphone on mute at all times during today's study and also please turn off your video if you're exercising, you're eating or if you need to step away from the screen for any reason, please just disconnect your camera. So now we are going to turn over to Harlan G in Scottsdale, Arizona, who's going to host, hold our study today. So good morning to you, Harlan. Good morning, Maria. Thank you very, very much. And I'm so honored to be here. This is going to be a little bit of a special departure from our normal study of the big book. We are probably not going to do very much, if any, work today on Chapter 7, which is where we find ourselves today. But we're going to talk about what the most appropriate subject is today, and that is the history of our forerunner, our forefather, Alcoholics Anonymous. This is June the 10th, 2023. So we have 1935, 65, 85, 88 years ago today, we have the founding of Alcoholics Anonymous in Akron, Ohio, a very unlikely place, a very unlikely group of people, but we're going to find out a little bit more today, hopefully, about how this did come about and how this, uh, how this uh, fellowship sprung up from. But before we do anything like that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about some of the things that alcoholism and alcoholics went through during the centuries. For thousands and thousands of years, alcoholics suffered tremendous, tremendous prejudice and tremendous injustices and tremendous scrutiny at the hands of a society that neither accepted them, nor approved of them, nor wanted them. And for thousands of years, thousands of years, alcoholics were put into asylums. They were locked up and there were unspeakable things done to them. Um, women alcoholics fared far worse than their male counterparts for centuries. For many centuries, once an alcoholic's family was approached and they had to do something with them as, it's, as it were, that was not something that was very kind. And modern, not modern times, but in the last hundred or so, 200 years, when an alcoholic man would go into an institution like an asylum, he would very seldom come out. Very, very seldom would he actually come out of that asylum. When women went into these insane, these insane asylums, which is where they put them is in the state insane asylums because they didn't know what else to do with them. Many of them faced involuntary hysterectomies. Many of them were raped repeatedly had children with their rapists, uh, you know, that were born from these rapes. They were, uh, uh, they were given uh, lobotomies against their will. It was one thing to be a male uh, alcoholic, but to be a female alcoholic meant that you were a slut, you were a whore, you were a fallen woman, and you were treated in a much more inhumane way than their male counterparts. They were very, very ostracized. And it was a horrible, horrible situation that went on in this country until relatively modern times, like the 1950s and 1960s. For hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years, people wondered about alcoholism itself. What is it? What, what, how, what do we do about it? 
and going back as far as the Old Testament in the book of Solomon, Solomon, the king of Israel, he hypothesized that alcoholism was an illness, but he couldn't prove it and he had no cure for it. In the 1640s in England, there was a doctor there and his name was Dr. Trotter. And Dr. Trotter, he philosophized in the 1640s that alcoholism was an illness, but he couldn't prove that and he had no remedy for it. Going back as, not, as far as 1790 in the United States of America, the very first Surgeon General of the United States, a man by the name of Benjamin Rush, and if you ever come to Chicago, Illinois, you will find a street called Rush Street, very touristy, very kind of high-end uh, restaurants and high-end bars, things like that on Rush Street. And Rush Street is named after Benjamin Rush, who was appointed by George Washington as the very first Surgeon General of the United States. We're going to come back to Benjamin Rush in just a little bit. In the 1900s, in New York City, you had a doctor who was a neurologist, unconcerned at all by alcoholism, unconcerned about alcoholism. He was a neurologist, but he was a bit uh, overinvested in the stock market. And when the Great Depression hit on Black Tuesday, Tuesday, October the 29th, 1929. He lost everything he had. And he went to work in the Towns Hospital in New York, which at that time was the preeminent drying out hospital for movie stars and entertainers and, and playboys and the wealthy in New York City. And he went to work there as the medical director of that hospital. We'll come back to Dr. Silkworth in just a little bit. We had not only in Europe, but we had in this country many efforts to enforce temperance, enforce uh, prohibition, temperance upon the citizens. Uh, alcohol was a very hot button subject for many. And many believe that alcoholism was a scourge. Many believe that alcohol itself was a scourge on our society. Going back to uh, uh, Ireland, back in 1829, you had the Ulster Temperance Society. In Ulster, in, uh, Ireland, you had a temperance society of people who were trying to enforce this no drink uh, situation onto the citizens of Ireland, the Ulster Temperance Society in 1829. In England in 1862, you had the Church of England Temperance Society. And this was a European group started in England. And they were people who believed that in England, alcohol was a scourge, alcoholism was a scourge, and it was a curse. And they wanted it stopped. And so they banded together to do everything they could possibly do to um, to get people to not drink. And they were very much against the manufacture and sale of liquor. And they definitely wanted people not to drink. Now, we have to put into perspective that Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob and Hank Parkhurst and all these other people were a product of their times. And in this country in 1840, in 1840, in Baltimore, Maryland, you had what was called the Washingtonian Movement or the Washingtonian Temperance Movement. It was started in a bar, ironically. It was started in a bar in, in Baltimore, Maryland by six people, two of which the main founders were Bill Mitchell and David Hoss. And all six of the founders of the Washingtonian movement died drunk. And one of the biggest mistakes they made was they became embroiled in getting people not to drink. Yes, that was true. They did that. But they also became embroiled in many, many outside issues, such as slavery, such as taxes, such as government 
government situations. They were involved in things like the Kansas-Nebraska Act. They wanted to infor inflict their will on whether Kansas and Nebraska would be admitted as slave states or whether they would be admitted as free states. So they got embroiled in lots and lots of different uh, issues that they never should have been involved in had they stuck to their to their um had they stuck to their subject of the abolition of alcohol they may have been worth it may have been worthwhile interestingly enough in 1848 a young guy in Springfield Illinois who was a congressman at that time you may remember him his name was Abraham Lincoln and he was a congressman at that time in 1848. And he gave a very famous address to the Washingtonians in which he said, alcohol seems to do something for you fellas, not to you fellas, but for you fellas, that it doesn't seem to do for folks like me. Now, how astute was that observation when he is there with absolutely no information that he could see through his observation that alcohol did something for these guys that it did not seem to do for people like him. And so he was very, very astute in his observation. And if you ever see a collection of Abraham Lincoln's most famous speeches, his address to the Washingtonians in 1848 will always be included in that group of speeches. So Abraham Lincoln was one of their speakers and they had lots and lots of very famous speakers. And when they would have speakers, they would call members of the press to come and listen. They would call members of the press to write articles. And they would often argue amongst themselves as to who was getting the most ink in the paper as to whether you got the most ink when you spoke or I got the most ink when I spoke, things like that. And it was getting in their way and they went the way of the dodo bird. But what we have to remember once again is that the founding fathers, and when I talk about the founding fathers, I am not just talking about Bill and Bob. Let's cover something right here, right now. Bob Smith was not recognized as the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous for several years after it had been going. Hank Parkhurst had a much tighter grip on the title co-founder. Abby Thatcher had a grip on it for a short period of time until he picked up liquor. Uh, Hank Parker, certainly Fitz Mayo. There were others who had a claim to this co-founder status. The problem with most of these guys like Ebby and, so, and Hank Parkhurst is they went back and drank. So Dr. Bob is recognized as, and I'm wearing my Dr. Bob's house shirt today. I'm not taking anything away from Dr. Bob, but he became the co-founder in history because he was pretty much the last man standing. He was pretty much the last man standing. These guys were all drunk and drinking and he wasn't. So it was a situation where he, by default, became the co-founder. At first, he was just really the point man in Akron. He was just the point man in Akron. Bill was very clear when he visited Bob in on May the 12th, 1935, that Ebby Thatcher had brought him the message along with Soapworth and you know the then members of the, you know, the, these guys in the Oxford group. Hey, um, so anyway, so we have this situation going on. But we have to remember that Bob and Bill and all these other guys were basically born at the end of the 1800s, the end of the 19th century. Well, they were products of their time. And in 1874, in Hamilton, Ohio, the Women's, Christians Temp Women's Christian Temperance Union was founded. And it was founded there, and it was spearheaded by a woman who came a little after the founding, and her name was Carrie Nation. And she was from a place that I'm very, very familiar with called Evanston, Illinois. 
And she was arrested about 30, 35, 40 times because she would go in with an ax and she would destroy saloons and destroy their equipment, smashing bottles. So she did a lot of damage to people's property in her zeal to get people that to stop drinking. And Carrie Nation's group, the, the, uh, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, they had slogans like Li uh, lips that touch liquor will never touch mine. They encouraged women not to kiss or make love to their husbands until their husbands agreed not to drink. And they would go in and they would smash saloons and they would smash up uh, you know, beer and they'd smash bottles of liquor, things like that. They would go into breweries and do quite a bit of damage. And as I say, she was arrested many times as were her cohorts, as were her followers in that area around Evanston, Illinois. So Carrie Nation and the Women's Christian Temperance Union and all these various prejudices that people have had for many, many years against drink were coming around the time that Bill and Bob and Fitz and Hank and Jimmy Burwell were children. Most of these guys are, these guys were born at the end of the 19th century when these movements were quite, quite strong. Dr. Bob was born in 1879. Bill was born in 1895. So they have vivid memories of this movement or this situation, this, this societal movement against drinking. Well, around the time that the 20th century was 20 years old, we enacted prohibition. And prohibition was the law of the land from 1920 to 1933. And there were the wets and the dries. And you hear a reference in the big book, wets versus dries, because you have to, again, remember, these guys were a product of their times. What were the wets? The wets were people who believed in moderation. The government should not be interfering in the manufacture and distribution of liquor. Uh, and liquor and alcohol does have some medicinal purposes, some medicinal advantages for people who use it, if they can use it, you know, uh, reasonably. I mean, as far back as 1888 in this country, you had a whole political party. And the name of this political party was the, Prohib the Prohibition Party. And they were pushing for prohibition 40, 30 years, 32 years before it became the law of the land. And so you have a situation on your hands where um, you have a lot of backlash, a lot of societal prejudice against drinking. And this is how these guys came into the world. Dr. Bob even talks about the advent of the bootlegger, the bootlegger who sold him his liquor. And if you've ever been to Dr. Bob's house, you see the back airing porch. And that's where the bootlegger, so named because they would sell you a bottle and they would often keep it in their boot to hide it. But the bottom line is, is that they would throw it out there and Dr. Bob would arrange to have the guy paid. And this is how Dr. Bob got his fix of liquor. But in 1920 to 1933, the sale and distribution of liquor was prohibited. Prohibition comes from the word to prohibit means to, to stop or to enforce an estoppel therefrom. So the situation was this, that you could only get liquor from illegal sources at that time. There was alcohol available to certain doctors, and Dr. Bob, being a doctor, he could tap into some of those sources, and he would just guise it up as a medicinal situation. Well, the bottom line is, is that um, we have a situation where now... I'm going to ask you to give your attention to the state of Rhode Island. So in your mind, go to Rhode Island. And what we're going to do is in Rhode Island, we are going to visit a man whose name was Roland Hazard. And Roland was a very wealthy industrialist. And his parents had come to this country at the end of the 1600s. And they were very wealthy and they came over at a very early time in our nation. 
and they owned a company called Burlington Mills. And if you've ever walked on carpeting in your life, you have probably walked on Burlington carpets. And they were major stockholders in another company that is still traded on the New York Stock Exchange today. And it is called Allied Chemical. And they were major stockholders in Allied Chemical. So these were very, very wealthy people. And so we have a situation whereby we have Roland Hazard, who is an alcoholic, and Roland is trying in the late 1920s to rid himself of this freaking alcoholism. He is trying to the best he can to rid himself of this scourge. And he so desperately wants to stay sober to show his parents that he can do it. And he goes on a Caribbean island and the quartermaster, the guy who brings him his supplies, brings him his stuff, the quartermaster is instructed not to bring him any liquor at all whatsoever. And for one year, Roland Hazard stays sober on this island, this Caribbean island. He manages to stay sober and so he gets off the island and the first place he hits for is Miami, Florida. Because if you're in the Caribbean and you want to or need to get back to Rhode Island, New York, wherever it is, the first place you need to go is Miami, Florida, where you can catch a train or catch a boat that will take you up to New York City. So this was his intention. Well, when he got up to Miami, Florida, what did he find? Bars, liquor stores, you name it. He found the things that he believed that his time sober would protect him from. And one of the things that we do know is no matter how long you're sober, it doesn't chase away your alcoholism. Remember in the big book, a man of 30 was doing a great deal of spree drinking and he decided he wasn't going to have another drink until he was successful in business and he remained bone dry for 25 years. He was a dry drunk for 25 years. Can you imagine? And out came his bottle and a car his carpet slippers and a bottle and he started drinking again and he was dead within four years. So Roland's one year of sobriety was certainly no match for this disease. He gets drunk right away in Miami. And Roland at that time, this is now we're into about 1930, 31. Roland Hazard is looking for sobriety. And the art of psychiatry. I didn't say the science. I said the art of psychiatry was in its infancy at that time. And so he sought out with money being absolutely no object. He sought out the services of the most preeminent psychiatrist in the entire world, Sigmund Freud. And he goes to Sigmund Freud and he says, will you take me on as a patient? And Sigmund Freud says, no. I'm loaded. I, do, I don't have any room for you. And so Roland Hazard asks Freud, who's the number two man? Who's your number one protege? And Sigmund Freud says, Dr. Adler. And uh, Roland goes to Adler in search of relief from his alcoholism. And Adler wasn't taking on any new patients either. So Roland Hazard asks Adler, well, who do you recommend that could help me? And he says, well, my boy, the number three man in our, in our art, our psychiatry, is a guy in Geneva, Switzerland. And his name is Carl Jung. J-U-N-G is pronounced Jung. Not Jung, not Jung, but Jung. And Roland goes to Paris, and from Paris, goes to Geneva, Switzerland. And while in Geneva, Switzerland, he checks into a hospital. You can't just do that today. You can't just show up at a hospital and say, I want to check in. They're not hotels. You can't just say, I want a room for the night at the hospital. You can't do that. 
But he did it then and he had the money to pay for it. And he stayed in this hospital for one year. And while he was in this hospital for one year, Dr. Jung came and psychoanalyzed him several times a week for an entire year. Now we're into 1934, 1933, excuse me, 1933. Roland Hazard goes to Paris on his way home to the United States. Roland is released from care by Dr. Jung. And Dr. Jung says to Roland, it's perfectly okay for you to go home. You're fine. He goes to Paris. And who does he see in Paris? He sees friends of his parents, of his mom and dad. They're in Paris at that time. And while they're in Paris, they meet Roland, not deliberately, but just by chance, and say, Roland, my boy, what on earth are you doing over here in Paris? And Roland tells them the story of his sobriety and tells him tells them the story of his adventure with Dr. Jung and all the things that he has been through with Dr. Jung. And they say, my boy, the sky is the limit. We are so happy to see you. We are going to celebrate right now. And they go down to a cafe in Paris. While there, they order the best bottle of champagne that this innkeeper has on, in store, in, in stock. And so the guy brings the champagne. And within a very, very short period of time, Roland finds out yet again that one year of sobriety or a thousand years of sobriety will not protect you from the ravages of alcoholism. And he is drunk in an extremely short period of time. Back he goes to Geneva, Switzerland with his tail between his legs and he goes back to Dr. Jung and Dr. Jung tells him something that Freud would not have told him and Adler would not have told him because Freud and Adler believed strongly that all, all, all healing was within the mind, within the cerebral mind. And Dr. Jung broke rank with them. Now, is it odd or is it God that Roland got to Jung instead of Freud or Adler? Because had he got to Freud or Adler, we might be sitting around psychoanalyzing ourselves or talking about, you know, whatever it is that they would be talking about. But he got to Jung and Jung told Roland in Geneva, Switzerland on that fateful day that here and there, there were people that had had spiritual experiences that changed their attitudes, ideas, and behaviors. And as such, Roland believed and begged Jung for information. Roland believed that if he too could have a spiritual experience, could he be healed from his alcoholism? Now, you have to again remember that at that point in life, the 1930s, no one that we know of had ever found a remedy for alcoholism. It was believed at that time that alcoholism was a hopeless, fatal condition. We talk about the disease being permanent, progressive, and fatal, or as my friend in Tulsa, Oklahoma says, permanent, progressive, and fatal. But it doesn't have to be fatal if we get treatment for it. And the treatment for it is a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps. But we, there was no steps then. There was no, there was nobody in the world that had recovered from alcoholism. There had never been a recovery from alcoholism. And Roland Hazard goes back to New York, but rather than seeking out a religious church, rather than seeking out a specific Lutheran or 
Christian or Pro Protestant, Catholic, whatever it was, or, or, or uh, Episcopalian, whatever it was, he goes back into something that is also very new at this time, and that is the Oxford Group Movement. The Oxford Group Movement was started in 1921 by Frank Buckman, who was a Lutheran minister. And he had a resentment. Can you imagine? He had a resentment against the Lutheran church. And Frank Buckman believed strongly that followers of Jesus Christ had lost their enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. There's a great word. Enthechos is, a, is two Greek words. Greek words, enthechos, from God. Enthechos enthusiasm. It's a Greek word. It means from God. And they had lost their zeal for Christ. They had lost this enthusiasm. And first century Christians were willing to be fed to the lions and tigers to show their devotion to Christ. But Christians had lost this. And he wanted to bring this enthusiasm back to Christianity. So he went to England near Oxford University, and he started a group of people who were also dedicated to enthusiasm through through work uh, and, and, you know, toward Christ. And he said, no, what we're doing just isn't cutting it. What we're doing is just not right. And so he gets sent on a mission to China. Buckman does. And Buckman goes to China. And he goes to China in the 1930s. And while in China, he sees people who had the zeal, who had this enthusiasm, enthechos, from God. They had this enthusiasm for their Christianity. And he sees something very different about these Chinese Christians that he didn't see back in uh, New York, and he didn't see it back in Pennsylvania, and he certainly didn't see it in England. What did he see? He saw people that were practicing altruism. Altruism. What is altruism? Altruism is giving with no expectation of a return. None. There was no expectation of a return. And these people who were altruistic were enthusiastic for Jesus Christ. And he brought this idea of altruism back to England. And they started practicing this altruism. And so he saw the level of enthusiasm, this level of zeal. This level of pure ecstasy over their Christianity rise in his followers. The point man for the Oxford group in New York City was a guy by the name of Sam Shoemaker, just like the cobbler, Shoemaker. And Sam was an Episcopalian minister who got involved with the Oxford group movement because he believed that it was the way to go. And he liked it. And he had his office or his central place in the cavalry mission in New York City. Now, to this day, if you go to the cavalry mission in New York, you make a right. You walk in, you make a right, and then another right. There is a beautiful stained glass window in there. And it says at the bottom, this window donated by Roland Hazard III, and that's Roland Hazard of our lineage to this day. Roland goes to New York, and he meets two other people. One of those people is a guy by the name of Shep Cornell, and one of them is a guy by the name of Sebra Graves Jr. Those are some names you don't hear very often anymore, Sebra and Shep. I think that most people would agree. You don't, you just don't see people named Sebra or Shep very often anymore. But these guys had something in common with Roland Hazard. And that's why Shoemaker wanted to introduce them because Roland was a drunkard coming to the Oxford group 
in search of a spiritual experience so that he wouldn't drink if his ideas, attitudes, and behaviors could be changed. And Shep Cornell was in the same boat as was Zebra Graves Jr. And they became good friends and fast friends. Now for a long time, about a year, Roland is staying sober in the Oxford group movement. And he decides that him and his friend Zebra Graves Jr. are going to take a trip to Rhode Island so that Zebra Graves Jr. can relax and take it easy on the hazard estate. He'll meet his friends, he'll meet his family, and then they'll go back to New York. And they go up to Rhode Island, and they go up to Rhode Island in the late summer of 1930. And while they're there, they meet the Hazards, who were very wealthy, I told you that. And the Hazards are quelling, even though they weren't Jewish, they were quelling. What does quelling mean? Quelling means rapture beyond belief. The Jewish mother goes to see her uh, daughter being sworn in as the first female president of the United States. And somebody says, oh, you must be so proud. And she says, and yes, but my son is a doctor. That's a mother who is quelling. That's a mother who's happy. Her son is a doctor and her, her daughter is the first president of the United States. So she's quelling. She's very, very happy. And the hazards tell Roland, wherever it is you want to go, we will pay whatever you want to do. And Zebra Graves Jr. says to Roland, you know, I would like you to come to East Dorset, Vermont and meet my family. Now, who do we know that's from East Dorset, Vermont? Oh, yeah, Bill Wilson. He's from East Dorset, Vermont, isn't he? We'll come back to that in a few minutes. Let's now take a look at what's going on in Albany, New York. In Albany, New York, there is something going on that is going to change the course of human history. It is now the summer of 1934. And in Albany, New York, Roland, uh, a man by the name of Edwin Ebby Thatcher is drunk. And his family is sick and tired of his drunken escapades. And they send him to Manchester, Vermont, to the summer home. Many wealthy people in New England had, excuse me, had summer homes in Manchester, Vermont. I've been to Manchester, Vermont. It's gorgeous. It's absolutely stunning. Uh, having a summer home there would probably be a very smart idea. Very smart. So Ebby is now at the summer home in Manchester, Vermont. It is the summer of 34. He's painting a gutter, painting a wall. And some pigeons land on the gutter. And he does what most alcoholics do that are drunk. He goes in the house and he gets his shotgun and he starts blasting the pigeons who are, of course, long gone by then, long gone by then. And the neighbors call the police and Ebby is brought into the police station and put on double secret probation. Have you ever seen the movie Animal House? Delta House was put on double secret probation. And Ebby is told that if there's one more drunken outburst, he's going to go to Brattleboro to go to the insane asylum. Brattleboro is a city in Vermont, but it is also the place where the local insane asylum is located. And that's what they did with drunks in that time. They put the drunks in the insane asylum and locked them up for an indeterminate period of time. It is now August of 1934, and Ebby has been clean on his own willpower for a month or two, something like that, a month maybe. And he drives drunk right through a woman's kitchen, right through the house. 
It's in East Dorset, Vermont, or Manchester, Vermont, excuse me. He's in Manchester, Vermont, and he is arrested in Manchester, Vermont, because he drove right through a woman's house and doesn't show even the slightest bit of contrition, nothing. He goes into the house, he gets out of his car and says, hey, toots, how about a cup of coffee? Well, she's going crazy. She calls the police. The police come and lock Ebby's butt up. It is now early September of 1934. Ebby is about to be remanded to the state insane asylum at Brattleboro, Vermont. On that weekend, if it was the weekend before or the weekend afterwards, I'd be in a piano box in Chicago. I'd be dead. But because God's timing is absolutely perfecta mundo, he is, these guys are in East Dorset. And who are they? Roland Hazard and Zebra Graves Jr. Roland Hazard and Zebra Graves Jr. are in East Dorset, Vermont, right at the weekend that they hear about Ebby going back to the, not back, going to the insane asylum. So Zebra Graves Jr. and Roland Hazard have an idea that if Ebby could come back with them, because Zebra Graves knew of Ebby, he knew that Ebby was an alcoholic, it was known to him. And they believed that the, if they could take Ebby back to New York to go to the cavalry mission with them, that maybe it would help them. And they approached the judge in early September of 1934. And the judge's name in East Dorset, Vermont, that was handling Ebby Thatcher's case, happened to be a guy by the name of Zebra Graves Sr. Is it odd or is it God that the judge was the father of one of the people trying to help Ebby? Is it odd or is it God that this man, the father of Zebra Graves Jr., just happened to be the judge? In September of 1934, Ebby is given a choice. He can either be remanded to the state insane asylum in Brattleboro or go with these guys back to the Oxford Group movement. He called them holy rollers and wanted no part of them, but he didn't want to go to the insane asylum either. And so he decided that going with the holy rollers was the lesser of two evils. And in September, he comes to New York and he goes into the Oxford group meetings. He goes into the Oxford group and from September to October, he is sober one month. From October to November of 1934, Ebby is sober two months. For the first time in his adult life, he is not only sober, but he's glad of it. And at that time, he is working what the Oxford group had were tenants. And we turn them into steps. And the six tenants, the six tenants of the Oxford group were complete deflation dependence and guidance from a higher power, moral inventory, confession, restitution, and continued spreading of God's word, which we turned into continued work with alcoholics. So there is a book, I'm not recommending it, there's a book here in the history of the Oxford group that was written in 1933, and it explains every one of these tenants. It's a beautiful book, um, but the bottom line is this won't help you recover. The only book that I know of that will help you recover is the big book of AA, but this is good entertainment. I like reading books about our history and stuff like that. But anyway, there's also four absolutes, absolute love, absolute honesty, absolute purity, and absolute unselfishness. And Ebby is practicing these four absolutes, and he's practicing these tenets, and he is staying sober for two months. 
And they go to Ebby and they say, Ebby, it is now time for you to go give testimony. And he says, well, what's testimony? They said, well, now you have to go tell somebody what we did, what God did, what we did for you. He goes, well, go, I don't want to go give testimony. And they said, oh, that's okay. We can remand you back to Vermont where you'll be put in the Brattleboro Insane Asylum. And he says, you know, I think I'll go give some testimony. So he thinks and he thinks and he thinks and he thinks, who can I give testimony in front of about what God has done for me and not embarrass the living crap out of myself? And he thinks about his old drinking buddy, Bill Wilson. And in November of 1934, Ebby calls the Wilson, not the Wilson, the um, Burnham home at 182 Clinton in Brooklyn and makes an appointment to go to dinner with Bill and Lois at their home on a bleak November night at the end of November, 1934. And he shows up there fresh skinned and glowing. I don't have the time to uchki with my computer, but I have pictures of me standing on that stoop. And I was fresh skinned and I don't know if I was glowing, but I was fresh skinned because I was abstinent and it was, it was the end of the summer. So I had a tan and so on. But the bottom line is I don't know about glowing or fresh skin, but I stood on that stoop and it was quite a, quite a remarkable experience. And Ebby will enter the Wilson home on a bleak November night in 1934. And we will find something out that night that we never suspected before. That one alcoholic could get through to another alcoholic where no one else could. Because up to that point, for the thousands of years prior to this, it was believed that only a clergy person, only a doctor, only a sober person could tell an alcoholic anything to straighten him out. And we're going to find out that the language of the heart transcends knowledge. That there are things that the person who suffers from alcoholism knows and sees and smells and is that non-alcoholics are not. That we speak that language of the heart to the compulsive overeater anywhere. And Clancy Immeslin leaves us with this, in, with, with many inheritances, but what Clancy Immeslin says to us is this, when one alcoholic speaks to a second alcoholic, so that the second alcoholic's feelings of differences abide. And the second alcoholic begins to take action after action after action after action that he does not yet even believe in. This is the point where recovery can take place. That one alcoholic could affect another alcoholic as no one else can. Now, Bill didn't get sober right away. He did not. It took a few weeks, and he was going to the Oxford group meetings drunk, but he saw something in Ebby that he wanted. Bill had been drunk for most of 17 years. He started drinking in 1917. This is December of 1934, 17 years. Bill was born in 1895. So he, at this time in 1934, was, help me out here, guys, 34 and 5, 39. He was 39 years old. He had just turned 39, November 26th. And he came into the town's hospital on December the 12th, December 11th, 1934, drunk. He will stay sober on the 12th and the 13th. On the 14th, after two days of sobriety, Bill will work what we know today are the steps. And he will never find it necessary to drink again throughout the rest of his life. In April of 1935, after failure 
was all around him trying to sober up drunks because Bill, while he was in the hospital, had the thought that there were thousands of alcoholics who, like he, could benefit from this message and that it was his job to bring that message. He was a failure. And he says to his wife, Lois, in April of 1934, right before he leaves to Akron, Ohio, in a proxy fight, over a company called Akron Tool and Die. And Bill Wilson says, I don't get it. Nobody is staying sober. And she turned to him and changed the course of history and said, but you're staying sober. The results were there. He just couldn't see them. In attempting to pass this message to others, he himself remained sober. He goes to Dr. Silkworth right before he leaves for Akron, and Dr. Silkworth says to him, I've heard about some of these shenanigans you're doing out there in Greenwich Village in the bars, and you're talking to these drunks from a moral hilltop about God and God and God and God, and they're not going to listen to that. You've got to tell them what I told you about the allergy of the body and the twist of the mind. Bill leaves for Akron, and in May of 1935, May the 12th, after struggling to stay sober when his friends abandoned him in Akron at the Mayflower Hotel, he's pacing up and down and trying to not drink. And he knows the only thing that will work for him is if he takes action. Too many times in my life, I have wrestled with the temptation to eat and I succumb every time. But if I take action of getting out of myself, I will not succumb. He puts nickels in the phone. He calls up a bunch of reverends and a bunch of clergy people in search of a drunk. After about nine or 10 rejections from these clergy people in Akron, he stumbles upon a reverend Tunks. T-U-N-K-S, Reverend Tunks. And Tunks says, I don't know any drunks, but I know somebody who does. And her name is Henrietta Cyberling. And she's trying to sober up some doctor. And Bill Wilson doesn't want to call Henrietta Cyberling because the Cyberlings owned Goodyear Tire and Rubber. And he figures he doesn't want to do business with them after they know he's a drunk because that won't go very well. But he decides to make the call. And he gets Cyberling's daughter-in-law at the gatehouse, Henrietta Cyberling. And Henrietta Cyberling, unbeknownst to Bill, three weeks previous to him coming at the behest of Harvey Firestone, Harvey Firestone owned Firestone tire and rubber in Akron. And Firestone used to pay these preachers, these Oxford group ministers to come through Akron. Otherwise, it was too small of a place for them. They wouldn't go. They'd go to Cleveland. They would go to Cincinnati, but they wouldn't go through Akron. But Harvey Firestone had a son that was a drunk, and he wanted the Oxford group preachers to come through his town. And one day, three weeks prior to this date that we're going to talk about, May 12th, 1935, Mother's Day, they had a prayer session about Dr. Bob. Now, how many single women, because Henrietta Cyberling was going through a divorce, would say to a man she's never met in her life, oh, yes, come over to my house? Not too many. But because she absolutely expected an answer to her prayer, she knew that Bill was sent by God to sober up Dr. Bob. So she invites him to the house. And the next day was Mother's Day, May 12th, 1935. Dr. Bob was drunk the day before. And when Henrietta called over there and said, bring Dr. Bob here, I've got a rum hound from New York that wants to talk to him. Dr. Bob was drunk under the table. 
It was the day before Mother's Day and he brought his wife a potted plant. And the pot and the plant were on the table and Dr. Bob was under the table potted. And they went the next day, Sunday, May 12th, 1935, 5 p.m., the Smiths walk in the door. And he had elicited from his wife, Ann, that they would stay 15 minutes and then Ann would get one of her headaches and they would leave. Bill and Bob met each other and went up to the library and they stayed up there for six hours. Bob, Bob Smith comes down and says, this is the first man that has ever understood my alcoholism. Now, why is that so funny? Because Bill never said anything about Bob's alcoholism. He only talked about himself. But he explained to Bob how he, Bill, was afflicted with an allergy of the body and a twist of the mind. And Bob related to him right down the line. Now, we like to think that Dr. Bob met Bill and stayed sober the rest of his life. That is not true. Bob Smith had one more good drunk left in him. And he left for the American Medical Association convention in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and got drunk on the way there, stayed drunk while there, and stayed drunk on the way home. Now, there's an error in the big book. Bob and Bill were not exactly stellar at remembering dates. It wasn't really June the 10th. It was more like June 17th. If you Google the American Medical Association Convention of 1934, you will find that it did not end on the 10th. It started on the 10th. So if Dr. Bob was at the convention, as he says he was, then he didn't get home until later on. But there is a discrepancy between the reality of the dates and the dates that we celebrate. But we celebrate June 10th as Founders Day. On June the 10th, 1935, Dr. Bob was to perform a surgery. He had been drunk in Atlantic City. And Dr. Bob did something for, uh, uh, Bill Wilson did something for Dr. Bob that a lot of AA sponsees wish their sponsors would do. He gave him a beer to settle his hand down so he could perform the surgery. Dr. Bob was a proctologist. And I'm glad he wasn't operating on my procto that day, to be honest with you. I'm sure glad he wasn't operating on me. But Dr. Bob got this beer and he, it steadies, steadied his hand so that he could perform this surgery. That night at 11.45 p.m., Dr. Bob is walking down Ardmore Street, sober as a judge. He had gone around doing the one thing he had absolutely refused to do before, and that is make restitution to the people he had harmed because he didn't want them to know he was an alcoholic. Little did he know that the only person in Akron that didn't know he was an alcoholic was him. And so what we find is that by one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic, once again, the process worked. And Dr. Bob, although he had some yearnings for alcohol during his life in the next two years, he never found it necessary to drink again and died in 1950 with 15 years of sobriety. Our fellowship hails from that time. We celebrate June the 10th. It was really more June the 17th, which is fine. But this is the birth of our, of our fellowship. And as we celebrate our beloved fellowship, our beloved way of life, I urge each and every one of you to please take a minute today, take a second today, 
It won't tax you that much. But thank God, thank God for this way of life. It has brought us together this morning. It has brought us together since 1935. From its stem, all manner of 12-step programs bringing relief to the afflicted. And for 10,000 generations into the future, for 20,000 generations unborn in the future, this way of life will sustain the afflicted. And it will elevate the afflicted above the power of their addiction so that they too can have the lives that many of us enjoy. There were many, many stories of people who choked to death on their own vomit so we could have what we have today. We are very lucky recipients of this inheritance. The men who walked before us, known and unknown to us, many whose names are buried in history, made a difference so that we could live free today. I did the best I could to recall everything. I don't write everything down, so I did the best I could. Please don't quiz me on some of the histories of these temperance movements. I don't you know, know everything I you know, could know about them, but I did the best I could. Um, we're gonna be back next Saturday on chapter seven. I promise you, we will cover sponsorship, but I felt it would be an insult today to realize that it was June the 10th and to not give it the credibility that it deserves so that we too can say we observed Founders Day in 2023. Just take a minute today to be very grateful for what you have. Before I turn it back over to um, Nancy or or, uh, or uh, Maria, I don't even remember who, but because, you know, I'm but anyway, I'm, 